Lorenzo, hast thou ever weighed a sigh? Or studied the philosophy of tears, a science yet unlectured in our schools? Hast thou descended deep into the breast and seen their source? If not, descend with me and trace these briny rivulets to their springs. This quote, ladies and gentlemen, nicely represents the situation with respect to the study of tears and crying, as it was nearly 300 years ago. But today, it's not really different. The study of tears is still in its infancy, and it's still a very lonely business. In some way, that's amazing, because tears have fascinated humans since ancient times. In the creation stories of ancient Egypt and of classic Greece, the tears of gods were used to create humans. And all over the world, tears are associated with new life, with fertility, and also with purity and sincerity. In addition, in many cultures, people came and come together for common singing, praying, and weeping in times of adversity or after disaster to promote the necessary social bonding. Occasionally, there was also some limited trust of scholars who debated about the origin of our of our emotional tears. Did they come from the hearts that were melting due to the hot passions? Or did they originate from the moist brains, so characteristic for the weak, like children, females, and old men? And others discussed about the capacity of, to weep of werewolves and witches and humans in afterlife angels and God. When I tell people about my fascination for tears, some react with interest, with surprise or wonder, and others with disbelief and sometimes even reproach. You see people think, couldn't you devote your time to more serious work? Apparently, I have some explanation some explaining to do, because people can hardly imagine why the work, why the study and work on tears is so fascinating and possibly important. There were three experiences in my life that triggered and fueled my fascination for this topic. The first was a question at a birthday party. Did I as a researcher in the area of stress and emotions, think that crying is healthy? I didn't know the answer. And therefore, I checked the scientific literature, and I couldn't find any relevant research, just musings. And some st students overheard me sharing this story and quickly decided, OK, then we shall be the first to conduct such a study. And this very modest study revealed that there was absolutely no relationship between the frequency of crying and self-reported health. And that was it, or so I thought. Until a few years later, it was a personal crying experience that rekindled my fascination for tears. It occurred when I was watching a film on television that had all the characteristics to qualify it as a sentimental B-movie. It was the film A Child's Wish, based on a true story of about a 16-year-old girl with cancer. And her father lost his job because uh, he took too much time off to care for her. And ultimately, he was responsible for the passage of the Family and Medical Leave Act in the US con Congress. The Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, allowed Missy to go to Washington DC to visit the White House and to meet the president, Bill Clinton, who played himself in that movie. 
And you see Clinton welcomed her in this Oval Office and told her that this room is the place where he receives the most famous and important people from all over the world, but that he considered her as his most important guest ever. And that specific scene triggered a totally unexpected reaction in me, a real flood of tears. I was completely overwhelmed. What was happening here? Why did I show this excessive reaction? Maybe you consider this rejection, reaction as just proof that I had turned into an old, sentimental, weak bloke with too little testosterone in my blood. But that's an understandable reaction, okay. But haven't you ever yourself had a similar experience? And how did you reflect on it? And did you try to understand why you displayed that most curious behavior? I felt that the study of these kind of reactions might help us to obtain a better understanding into who we humans really are. A further stimulation was when I read about Charles Darwin's denial of the usefulness of emotional tears. You know that in 1872, it was 13 years after the descent of man, Charles Darwin launched another most important book, The Expression of, man, uh, the Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. And in this book, he emphasized the importance of the expression of emotions for our well-being. More precisely, in the concluding chapter, he wrote, the movements of expression in the face and body, whatever their origin may have been, are in themselves of much importance for our welfare. We readily perceive sympathy in others by their expression. Our sufferings are thus mitigated and our pleasures increased, and mutual good feeling is thus strengthened. But surprisingly, in a previous chapter in the, this very same book devoted to weeping, his remarkable conclusion with respect to emotional tears was that they do not serve any function. Darwin described weeping literally as purposeless. For me as a scientist, it's of course a major challenge to prove that Darwin, at least in this respect, was totally wrong. I strongly believe that tears also have played an important role in our evolution and still do serve important functions. Without tears, we humans would have never become the empathic, ultra-social species that we currently are. For example, we take care of the old, of the sick and the disabled and we can work so perfectly together. I hope to clarify this viewpoint further by focusing on the question, why do only humans weep? And I will consider this question in two different ways. First, why do only humans and no other animals produce emotional tears? And second, what are the causes and effects of crying? Regarding the first perspective, that is, why only humans and no other animals produce emotional tears, I am convinced that the key to the answer to this question lays in another unique human feature, our prolonged childhood. Compared to most other animals, humans are extremely helpless. They are born immature, and their brains keep developing during life until the age of at least 20, 25. Most other animals, in contrast, are born ready-made and well-equipped with their physical appearance and their limited behavioral repertoire to survive in their specific living environment for example, the jungle, or the desert, or the mountains, or the rainforest. 
The disadvantage, however, is that they are not flexible and they, cannot hard, they can hardly adapt to changes in their natural habitats. Human children, with their continuously developing brains, in contrast, are real learning machines with a great flexibility and adaptive power. They can easily adapt to a wide variety of situations and conditions. However, the downside is that human childhood is also a very vulnerable period because children are still largely dependent on adults. And especially in this phase of life, tears are most important to elicit the necessary care, protection, and love from specific adults to make their full development possible. You may wonder why tears and no vocal crying as other animals do. Well, as soon as the infant is able to move towards a specific individual, for example, the mother, for the necessary care, love, and protection, the great advantage of silent tears is that this specific call for help can be aimed at an individual without showing one's weakness to others, including possible predators or, and, or assaulters. And thus, it is much safer than vocal crying. Regarding the second question, what kind of situations makes us humans weep? The answer is, that depends. Age is very important. As you can see, crying is a dynamic behavior, and its causes and triggers show some remarkable developments during life. Powerlessness, separations, and the loss of significant relationships remain significant reasons to cry throughout life. On the other hand, crying over physical pain shows a remarkable decrease with advanced age, whereas empathic crying and sentimental or moral crying shows a strong increase. So, adults not only cry in negative situations, such as losses, failures, and helplessness, but also in the opposite, positive situations, such as the intensification of relationships, all kinds of pro-social behaviors, and exceptional performances. Apparently, once we are adults, tears also became a, become a kind of exclamation marks. They are a signal to ourselves to remind us of our ultra-social nature and to stress the importance of good social and moral functioning. So they are not just a signal to others, but especially to ourselves. Not just receiving help, but also providing help is important. Concerning the effects of crying on the crying individual himself or herself, we learned that the effects on mood depend on three factors. First, the characteristics of the crier. For example, um, depressed patients seldom report mood benefits. Second, the specific nature of the cause, the extent to which we are in control over the situation. And third, in particular, how others react to our tears. When others react with understanding and comfort, it's a completely different story than when they react with disapproval and anger. We further showed in our laboratory that it might take some time before the positive effects of crying manifest themselves. Finally, here you see how the effects of crying take some time to develop. Finally, 
How does crying influence others? When we expose study participants to pictures of crying individuals, they reportedly experience more empathy, they feel more connected, and they are more willing to provide support to the same individuals uh, without tears. Visual tears thus make a strong difference on how we perceive others and tend to react to them. So, next time you cry, be aware of the power of tears. It might not really be healthy, but be comforted, not just by the weeping itself, but especially in the knowledge that you are doing something 